Good morning, everybody, and thank you for being here for season two of the Building Performance Interactive Series. My name is Zach Semke. I am uh, with Passive House Accelerator, and I'm super excited for today's program. Um, before we dive into the program today, I want to just explain a little bit about the role that I will play, which is as Q&A concierge. So as questions occur to you during today's presentations, um, please type them into chat and we'll be uh, tracking those questions. And when the discussion session uh, time comes up later in the program, we'll invite you to ask your question directly of the presenters. Um, so I wanna also thank Partel for collaborating with PassFast Accelerator on this series and, and uh, creating the series uh, last year. It's very exciting to be re-upping it in 2023. Um, we will be joined today with by co-hosts Hugh Wariski and Ben Adam Smith, uh, and they will be helping to keep the, the conversation flowing today. We'll be joined by guest presenters Pat Kerwin and Brian Kennedy, who will talk about off-site construction meeting growing demand for better buildings. So with that, I'll hand it off. Yeah. Hi, I'm Ben Adam Smith from House Planning Help website, and we're a website that focuses just on housing, trying to make it better. Also, if you've got an existing property, what it might look like to make it healthier, more energy efficient, and how you might go about that. So, yeah, it's great to be back. We've done the first season, so season two. Uh, I think Mike is not with us this time, but we're hoping he'll be back in the next session. Um, but Hugh's here. Hi, Hugh. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, thanks, everyone. I guess my name is Hugh Wierski. I represent Partel. We're a materials provider for the built environment, so membranes, tape, sealants to, um, I suppose, to lots of the modular construction companies, and we operate in the UK, in Ireland, North America. Um, but today, yeah, thanks to the Accelerator for the collaboration again, um, to all the guests for joining, um, and our, um, I suppose, our, our presenters here. So today, I'd kind of, I suppose, really like to to introduce Pat Kerwin. Um, Pat Kerwin is a director and the head of modern methods of construction at C&W O'Brien Architects. Um, Pat has been a, I suppose, a, a driving force in the industry for the last uh, number of decades. He's an early advocate for sustainability in the industry and was actually one of the founding members of the Irish Green Building Council who have consistently pushed and helped to um, I suppose, make targets for lower carbon um, more mainstream and yeah, having a real impact. Um, I suppose Pat has worked on many high profile projects, um, the redevelopment of Spencer Dock, the Aviva Stadium, the Central Bank, bank in the Docklands. Um, he's also implemented BIM strategies on large scale projects. Um, I first met you, Pat, I think in 2012 on a woofy course and yeah you're someone i know to be i suppose an innovator with a skill set that's got, that goes kind of all the way from sustainability to compliance uh, to building physics so kind of the ideal person to take us all through um mmc and what it means today so over to you pat uh hi all and um, thanks for the introduction uh you uh very flattering <laughs> um uh i think those those days in 2012 i think uh Certainly a long time ago, uh, sitting down, working our way through the, the woofy software. Uh, so I think we've uh, come a long way since then as, as an industry. Um, I guess the, today, this afternoon for, for us here in Dublin, uh, probably morning, early morning for most of the participants. Um, but uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, modern methods of construction and how do we transition uh, between lean and green construction. So <clears throat> implementing sustainability uh, strategies through modern methods of construction using lean, lean design and lean construction methods uh, to achieve sustainability goals. Um, I think it's always good to, to remind ourselves, you know, why are we doing this? Why, why do we need to really embrace uh, a more sustainable, um, low carbon built, in, uh, built environment and particularly a construction industry? Um, the latest report from the IPCC, IPCC uh, really identifies a critical need um, to tackle global emissions uh, in order to uh, 
reduce the, the impact of, of global warming, particularly as we perhaps begin to look at exceeding uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, and again, just a, a brief summary from the, the, the latest IPCC report, just kind of captures, um, we're absolutely at a critical path. We're at a critical, we're at a crossroads where we've already missed certain opportunities to really embrace uh, and tackle climate change. Um, and we're now at the, the, the critical juncture of, we need to start actioning, we need to start stop talking and actually doing. Um, and yet, as you can see here, in terms of the, the present situation, we can really drive on in terms of tackling uh, the impacts, or we can carry on with not, uh, business as usual and um, end up with, with significant uh, issues in terms of uh, that, that global warming impact. I think we always, generally, I think we, we see in life, I think we say, you know, issues, it doesn't really affect us. It's someplace else, uh, you know, that's in another part of the world. It's not really impacting here. I don't really see the change. This particular slide shows the, the average air temperature um, uh, over a period in Ireland, Ireland being a small country. So you can see in terms of 1900 all the way up to 2019, there's a, a significant difference in terms of the, the surface air temperature, the rising of that temperature. So it is a global problem. It is affecting every single country, uh, every single part of the world. So we do need to really begin to uh, action uh, those issues. And how do we action that? You know, in terms of we're all here, we're all involved, we're all involved in the, the built environment. The built environment, according to the World Green Building Council, um, uh, contributes approximately 39% of global emissions, uh, carbon emissions uh, annually. That's a significant impact when you look at, you know, the, the, the physical act of construction. So it's really, you know, imperative that those actors, that those participants within the construction industry will really build the knowledge and start actioning on that. And if we look at that 39%, you can see the breakdown, 28% in terms of operational carbon uh, and 11% in relation to embodied carbon. I think we're beginning to look at the operational carbon, the likes of uh, passive house um, uh, methodology, fabric first approach, you know, reducing the, the, the impact, really new innovative technologies in terms of uh, low carbon technologies, etc. But also, actually, all of those new technologies, all of those new methods um, that we're deriving out to, to, to reduce the operational carbon also have an embodied carbon impact. So we need to start looking at a holistic approach uh, to, to carbon, not just the operational carbon, but right through the process um, and tr from the materials, uh, from uh, all aspects. And how do we do that? Again, referring back to the, the World Green Building Council, a chart, the absolutely optimum uh, time to do this is at early strategic uh, stage in terms of any project at planning. Obviously, to reduce the impact, we build nothing. We can't do that. We, we're, we're growing global uh, population. We need to start building more. We need to start building infrastructure and uh, uh, critical facilities such as hospitals, schools, etc. So we need to, to look at that. The next impact, uh, the next opportunity, we perhaps build less. So we need to look at um, using existing assets, deep energy retrofitting. How do we impact that? So then referring that back to modern methods of construction, how do we take modern methods of construction in terms of a deep uh, energy retrofit um, and look at the, the carbon impacts of that? And obviously, then we need to build clever and build efficiency, but we need to tackle that at the early design stages, at the strategic stages. Um, and what does that impact? And I guess this graph or this, this graphic really shows the, the, the impact of that at design stage. In my view, I think the design phase is the critical point because at the design phase, we're designing the building, we're identifying how it's going to be built, and uh, perhaps the, the construction methodologies which then has a direct relationship on the natural resources, the raw materials, how the raw materials are made. Then going forward into the production and the manufacturing process, you know, <coughs> again, the construction methodologies that we define now to build the asset that we've designed, you know, have, will have a direct impact on uh, the production and how we design 
you know, are we designing for reuse, readaptability uh, at the end of the, the, the life cycle of, of the asset? And then how do we re recycle the asset uh, at the end? So it's a circular economy. It's a, that circular process, which again, in my view, starts at the design stage. And it's critical that we start as designers within the built environment, that, that we build the knowledge and, and start addressing that. Um, in terms of the physical act of, of um, construction, the physical act of um, design, we can look to other industries such as the automotive industry um, in relation to more efficient, more optimization. Um, and this is where we kind of start to look at modern methods of construction, prefabrication, et cetera. And again, looking at a lean approach, um, these are the, uh, the, the, the five principles of lean, um, you know, identify the customer value, specify the customer value, identify uh, and map the value stream, create flow, uh, respond to customer uh, pull and per perceived perfection. But if we start overlaying a, an environmental approach to that, so this is, these are the main principles of lean, lean thinking uh, and it can be applied to lean construction. But if we apply an environmental aspect uh, onto that, so again, uh, identify customer value. So what is the what, what are the environmental goals of a project of a built asset? You know, identify and, uh, and map the value stream, develop up a roadmap, bring that into the design phase. How do we integrate that? What is a plan of work for uh, integration of sustainability right through the entire life cycle of the of the asset? Obviously, create flow by eliminating waste. We've many waste, and I'll come to that in a second. Um, and then respond to customer pull. So again, we can respond to the ongoing environmental changes that might be occurring, um, and be it legislative or you know climate change, we can then respond and recycle, re re review um, that process. Uh, perceived perfection, something that we don't really tackle within the built environment. Research, innovation, research and development. You know. Uh, as built audits, how do, how are our built assets performing, and feed that back into uh, into that that loop. Um, I spoke about the waste again, uh, the seven waste of, of Muda, which will be defined out by uh, the Toyota production system. And again, we can apply these. These are waste that would have been identified to, uh, you know, say for example the uh, Toyota production system. But we can to look at these in the context of the environmental aspects. You know, inventory. Inventory could be applied to the raw materials. So if we start reducing the impact on the raw materials, we're reducing that waste, et cetera. Defects, you know, again, defects in terms of uh, construction methodologies. If we apply that to prefabrication, offsite construction, and we say, you know, we're, we're prefabricating the elements more, we get a better quality. So we're reducing the amount of waste in materials and defects, which again, obviously going to to uh, uh, improve the uh, environmental impact. Transportation, if we're beginning to move to uh, prefabricating in um, factory uh, environments, you know, perhaps we, we have less impact in terms of <clears throat> the logistics, the transportation of individual components to, to sites, whereas we, we can consolidate it uh, down into a, into a built element and deliver that, uh, deliver that to site. So again, we can take what you know the, the principles of other industries of other methodologies and start applying those to um, modern methods of construction and beginning to tease out the the, the aspects of uh, improving the environmental impacts. And then, which uh, leads into what are modern methods of construction, and um, as defined by the UK government, there's seven categories of modern methods of construction starting at uh, category one, which would be full volumetric modular, full built uh, elements, and they can be either shell and core, or they can be fully fitted out with furniture and fixed fixtures, right down to number uh, seven, where we get innovative on-site processes uh, leading um, uh, uh, to uh, improvements. So it's not just one particular element. The key here is to look at all of the various aspects of uh, modern measured construction and see how they play their part uh, in regards to uh, improving the environmental impact. A case study here from uh, London, uh, uh, developer the Mace Group, looking at uh, a very innovative uh, uh, modern method of construction and methodology of developing up uh, a residential uh, development, 524 apartments, um, 
across two towers and the anticipated result is that a 70% reduction in, in construction waste and transportation, um, et cetera. And that's using modern methods of construction over and above uh, the uh, built traditionally. So we can see that by using modern methods of construction, we're reducing the waste by approximately 7%, 70% if that building was built by traditional means. So I think the, the case studies here, it is proven that, that modern methods of, of construction do reduce waste. And again, another example for a project that's currently under construction in Croydon in London, um, full volumetric modular uh, tower. Um, it will be one of the tallest tower, volumetric modular towers in Europe and perhaps uh, in, in the world once, once complete, 44 storeys. Um, a study carried out by uh, the University of Cambridge looking at that film, seeing approximately a 40 to 54% reduction across the two towers in embodied carbon. So again, it's looking at uh, developing up the, the, the business case in terms of getting the quality, getting the, the productivity, improving, and then actually really targeting in on the embodied carbon and using, looking at the materials, um, you know, what, why, why is this building achieving such a, a, a reduced embodied carbon impact? Again, you can tease out in terms of the, the primary structure, less concrete um, and, and more uh, efficiency in terms of the, the materials, the lightweight approach to construction. So again, we can see here from an, a case study, it actually does work in terms of uh, reduction in carbon. Um, and again, if we, if we talk about sustainability, it's not just about the, the carbon impacts. We look at ESG, environmental social governance. We look at the social aspect of, uh, of sustainability. And we can see from a health and safety point of view, you know, that modern methods of construction can really improve the, the, the health and safety aspect. You know, as an example here, again, going back to, to the case study uh, by the MACE group, products were used um, where we had a, a facade system connected to a floor plate lifted onto the, onto the building. So the leading edge of the building was fully protected. You can see by the image reduced, um, significantly reduced labor on the actual floor plates. Um, so the risks are mitigated, the risks are reduced of uh, health and safety impacts. And if we refer back that to the Irish uh, construction industry in 2019, we had 140% increase in fatalities in Ireland in the construction industry. And uh, the vast majority of those were falling from heights. So again, you know, we can then see the benefits from a social point of view um, to using modern methods of construction. So what are the drivers? How do we do, how do we really push this on? Like there've been lots of, um, lots of strategies, lots of national strategies um, that, that begin to tackle this here in Ireland. We have the Climate Action Plan, which begins to articulate the need for embodied carbon in new developments. And we can see that in London at the moment in terms of, uh, a very high profile uh, developments being refused, planning consent, uh, because they're demolishing existing buildings and building new buildings. So it goes back to the reuse and readaptability uh, of the buildings. In Denmark, Denmark are a, um, a world leader in this. They've now mandated the use of uh, embodied carbon calculations within their uh, building regulations and using the circular economy and, and beginning to, to promote um, and tackling uh, embodied carbon within the uh, within the built environment through modern methods of construction, um, which again leads me on to my, my last slide. Um, the greatest danger in times of turbulence is not the turbulence, it's to act with that yesterday's logic. So we are at a critical point uh, in terms of addressing uh, climate change, and we really need to look to more modern methods to, to address those. Um, so I can take questions if necessary later. So I'll hand over uh, to, to Ben. Thanks, Pat. That's awesome. Let's move on now. Brian Kennedy is the managing director of Vision Built, a leading off-site manufacturing company based in the UK and Ireland. With over 16 years of experience in design and main contracting, Brian has a proven track record of delivering successful projects. 
He holds a Bachelor of Engineering degree from the National University of Ireland, Galway, and an MBA from Henley Business School. Brian has successfully completed projects in many sectors, such as pharmaceuticals, industrial, residential, retail, hospitality, and leisure. His passion for working collaboratively, utilizing lean processes and modern methods of construction combined with his embrace of innovative technologies ensures sustainable delivery. Thank you, Ben, for the nice introduction. Um, so um, look, it's great to be part of this. I think just before we go into a, a short video just on, on vision built in the business and, and what we're about, um, I think it's a really interesting, exciting time in the construction industry. Um, as Pat mentioned, we have a number of burning platforms, embodied carbon and our sustainable, our need for sustainable construction is a burning platform that's going to actually really accelerate the drive. And you can see it already from modern methods because we have to change. And I suppose modern methods of construction has been around a while in various different forms going back um, many years, but I think it's different this time. I think we have a number of enablers like digitization, we have the technology. I think we've burned in platforms, which Pat mentioned, and um, our need to drive down carbon. And I think a big element also is the change in in our skill sets. So, so our people and the traditional trades, the apprenticeships, they're not there anymore. So we have to innovate and come up with different ways to create built environments. And that's why it comes back to a factory environment. And I think that's why it's a really exciting time to be actually part of the construction industry, because that kind of flatline graph that has or even decline on the graph um, around efficiency in construction, I believe is about to change and about to change quite drastically. And I think we um, as professionals in the industry can really make sure that it, it changes in the right direction with quality always in mind um, and driving that carbon. So um, so the short video, and then I'll take some questions with, with Pat and the guys at the end. Thank you. My name is Brian Kennedy, I'm Managing Director with Vision Belt. We're here in the west coast of Ireland in Oran Moor and Galway, which is our main head office. Um, we have two factories as well, which are also based in the west of Ireland. One is in Sligo and one is in Mayo. Um, so this is, I suppose, where Vision Built originated in Galway. Uh, we've recently moved factories and moved office um, to upgrade our facilities. Um, and I suppose we, we supply here from all of Ireland nationally, and we also supply the UK from the west of Ireland. So quite an interest in... Um, company to have based in the west of Ireland in offsite manufacturing. So a lot of innovation, a lot of um, ingenuity around our product, product development, um, and we do maximise the amount of work we do in the factories offsite. Vision Built's base product is light gauge steel, um, so it's a highly flexible product um, and it's used in our modular volumetric um, offsite solution. So basically we manufacture our own light gauge steel, we utilise that to form our volumetric solutions and then that allows us to maximise, I suppose, the pre-manufactured value of our product. So basically we can maximise the amount of work that we do in the factories, taking away the, a lot of the risk from site um, into an environment which is highly controlled, highly regulated. Um, my own role, I suppose, as, as managing director is overseeing the large amount of people that we have in our own business, so that right through from design, right through to procurement, operations, factory, um, and our aftercare team as well. So that can include between direct and indirect up to 200 people, um, you know, and this is spread across Ireland and the UK and, and various different projects. We operate in the education market, we operate in the housing market, and uh, we also operate in the commercial market. Here in Vision Built, we predominantly are a mo modular volumetric, um, which is a CAT1 product um, in terms of offsite MMC. So traditionally, uh, we would have done a lot more of Category 2, which is 2D panelised light gauge steel. Um, and what we found in the market is that you know, our customers um, and ourselves in, tr in trying to continuously innovate and, and do more off-site, our volumetric offering allows that ability to do that. So while we get a lot of the fit-out trades, a lot of the um, finishing trades in the factory doing that work, which takes away the risk from site, um, we've also found that you know, doing more work in a controlled environment and um, not dealing with weather issues, not dealing with uh, site constraints can greatly inc increase the quality of our product. Um, so, so managing all them technical details um, 
hair tightness details, getting the right view value, thermal bridge, managing all that quality of work is a lot easier and more controlled in an environment that's, I suppose, easier to work in. So our, our volumetric modular solution is a, is a base product of light gauge steel. So first of all, that's panelized in our 2D facility. And so basically that panel then is used to form the box that creates the 3D environment for us to fit out to the roof and cladding, windows install, all that follow on works within this module. And the modules can range depending on product, depending on project, whether it's a school, education building or a house, you know, it can vary slightly in degree of finishes that we do in them buildings. So compared to traditional construction, um, off-site volumetric construction requires um, design procurement up front. Um, so one of the challenges is, is getting that information to allow design freeze, to allow us all to collaborate well together earlier in the project. So you're constantly de-risking the project, but once you go into the factory environment, you want to have all them details right up to your, you know, your light location, your socket location, all that level of detail in the design that allows the manufacturing and the process to continue through the factory unimpeded. And I suppose that's one of the challenges we have in the in, in the construction. It's changing that whole mindset to front load that um, activities and to understand and look at this I suppose there's tools and digitization virtual construction AR VR all that that can help us sort of visualize the finished building get that design up front um, and allow design freeze and allow a, a, a very streamlined process after that predominantly our customer base is government bodies and um, Department of Education housing sectors also we work with developers and some commercial clients and office buildings so our, pro our process in our company, um, we do a lot of in-house design. We've kind of a hybrid model where we outsource some of the specialist consultants' work, including fire, structural uh, at times as well. And I suppose that allows us to have flexibility to be able to scale up and scale down depending on de our demands. Here in our head office in Galway is, is where most of our de design department work. We predominantly use software, such so as the Autodesk suite of software, Rivet, Navis Works. We also have some specialised software, Vertex, framing software that allows us to have a CAM process, an automated process right to the factory floor. So you'll, you'll see some of our framing machines that allow this process to happen through the Vertex software and um, digitally trans transcribed through into the framing machines which then manufacture our steel exactly to that detail and that design in that model. So highly automated, highly efficient, very little waste um, process right from design to the factory floor. So a key tool we use um, right through our design and, and manufacturing process is, is our BIM modelling. So, um, so our, our designer is modelling in, in a complete 3D um, world where we basically have a twin model of the building. These digital twins are utilised through our manufacturing sequencing, through our detailing. So a lot of this um, information is, is utilised to communicate from the design department to the factory floor. So all our production supervisors would be trained up in reading the, the BIM model taking some dimensions off them, understanding how complex components go together and this is all in that kind of virtual world where we can tease out issues. Um, a lot of the process then is, is through a DFMA, a design for manufacture and assembly process. So I think one of the big changes from a construction project to more of a manufactured off-site product is the level of detail that we get into in our design. So we like to get to a place where every component is, is labelled, marked and um, kitted and that component then has various different uses but um, can be easily and efficiently put together in a, in a way that everyone understands. So our manufacturing process uh, starts um, with our raw material, which is typically coil steel. That's brought through our framing machines. So we have five different framing machines that swage, punch and roll at different depths, different thicknesses. That allows variety in our products. So whether it's a floor assembly, a wall assembly, a roof assembly, there might be various different build-ups needed. So while that product is then rolled through the framing machine, each of them components then is put together into a panelised product. Um, so that panelised product is configured typically screwed together um, and that panel then is used in our 3D volumetric solution. So in the pre-assembly or sub-assembly part of it is we might apply our insulation, our boarding, etc. So the various different build-ups is done in a, on a flat table, lifted into a vertical or horizontal depending on floor, walls or roof and put into a volumetric solution then allows all the follow-on trades to work in that environment. That's the the process sort of from start to finish in the factory. So in terms of our capacity, we range from about 700 units to 1,000 units per annum. Um, that can vary depending on 
what type of building we're doing, whether it's an education building or a housing building. So one of our largest customers is in the education sector. We do a lot of schools here nationally. One of the key advantages for offset manufacturing is the speed, you know, and I suppose the quality of the product that you can get in the factories. The education department have a, a real challenge in terms of capacity um, nationally and um, particularly in primary uh, schools. So what we can do is we can turn around buildings in quite a short period of time, especially when we have a kind of a standardised approach to the layouts of the buildings, the classrooms, uh, typically what they want. And I suppose we've worked with the Department of Education in terms of getting them layout standardised that suits modular construction. And then we're able to roll them out quite efficiently and at a, at a high speed. Department of Education um, sector really requires a, a speed of build, but also a really high quality product um, that will last for a century in terms of uh, environments for kids and, and teachers to work in. So what our, what our product offers is a very low U value and um, really high energy rating on the buildings and this is down to the thermal bridging details and the products that we use in it and I suppose the acoustics um, is, a, is a huge thing in school so how we detail our, our wall construction, floor construction um, and all that side of it is really critical so this is worked through um, standard details that we've rolled out and agreed with all parties and um, also I suppose from a fire rating you know um, fire regulation is really important. Our projects range in terms of the requirements of view value so we're quite flexible in, in terms of the, the view values that we can actually achieve right down to 0.12 but typically you know our U values range from 0.15 up to 0.18 and I suppose this helps with the whole energy efficiency of the building. Similar to the U values our air tightness of our buildings can get very low U values below one but typically the requirements of education buildings, healthcare buildings is always around that three limit uh, so that's that's typically what our buildings meet. So the durations of our projects range depending on the complexity etc but just for an example um, a large education building um, 30,000 square foot was done in less than 15 weeks and um, so this is a typical example and that same type of project in a traditional process could take up to 18 months. I think one of the key challenges across particularly in the education sector is having a standardised approach to the building so while we can introduce some bespoke elements to the buildings we want to keep the core of the building the mo most functional part of the building very standardised and this can be then rolled out at scale so it increases efficiency reduces costs and overall performance of the building is greatly improved in the education sector being a, a father of two kids you know uh, quite passionate about kind of the spaces that we create uh, for for our future generations to get educated so there's really interesting designs coming through in both modular construction and it's interesting how these spaces are adaptable for various different needs so while while it's while we're manufacturers by by trade we also think about you know what spaces we're creating for our future generation Thanks for that, Brian. Um, that was excellent. Um, so much covered. Um, so before we, I suppose, move towards questions, we're um, happy to move over to Des O'Donnell. Des is a technical director at CNW O'Brien and will provide some insight from, I suppose, how adoption can happen, maybe from the developer's position. Des has 30 years of experience in the Irish and UK construction industry. He's been involved in a wide range of high quality design projects um, going back to 1995. Um, in 2000, he joined um, Ready ANU as an architectural technologist, was later promoted to technical director for several years before leaving in 2021. Des has recently joined the team at CNW O'Brien as technical director, bringing his extensive knowledge and experience to the new role. Throughout his career, he's managed teams on complex projects such as large scale mixed use developments, apartment schemes, student housing developments, uh, through all stages of design to completion. In these projects, he has been involved in aspects of architectural design project and team management and has worked at senior management level for the last 13 years. He brings a wide range of experience and proven value to the projects he's involved in and is ideally placed to give us this insight into the drivers for adoption of MMC methods at scale. Over to you, Des. Uh, yeah, just as, as Hugh says, thanks you there for that uh, great uh, insight there. Um, so just in relation to the key drivers for adoption, so what we're looking at um, uh, basically in this table here is it just shows the, the level of 
um, productivity and how low it is. The red line represents construction, say in comparison to the um, green and blue lines, which represent um, the information, communication, and manufacturing industry. Um, and it just shows that the challenges that we face in the construction sector, which come from a number of different um, factors, things like lack of skilled labor and uh, inefficient processes, poor communication, lack of communication between the different parties involved in construction projects and delays, and et cetera, economic conditions, economic downturns lead to demand, demands for construction result in reduced productivity, government regulations and policies, affecting um, compliance requirements and lack of standardization uh, in construction progress and increased costs, technological gaps. The construction industry has, has um, uh, been seeing new technologies which can lead to increased inefficiencies and, and uh, the lack of transparency, environmental concerns, budget constraints. Uh, there's lots of constraints in relation to um, say budgets that limit the projects um, and have a, an impact and reduce productivity, safety concerns, and um, generally a lack of a, a lack of um, sorry, one second, a lack of uh, uh, involvement of uh, competent contractors in, in a project results in waste time. And uh, they often designs are not are fully developed before re realization of um, uh, can be met. Like so, so you end up redesigning, retendering, and this results in a substandard product. And and then what we're trying to do here is we're trying to look at the uh, the, the ways of improving productivity by say the building commitment to strong core values, investing in main principles, and uh, utilizing technologies, training staff. And in, in implementing innovative solutions to reduce resources and, and uh, improve delivery. Um, the, the, this, this shows basically that uh, in the industry, um, and this is Irish and global construction sector, that there's um, uh, lagging construction productivity costs the global economy 1.6 trillion a year. Now you can see there that the, the greatest um, uh, losses are coming from likes of North America, Europe, and, and working the way down. Uh, to the industries that and the countries that have a uh, lower construction uh, industries, but it's like 1.6 trillion, 63 trillion um, loss due to the the, the um, productivity issues. So that's a huge, um, say, challenge to try and uh, increase that. We need to look at R and D to increase productivity, uh, particularly in the Irish sector, and we need to look at um, improving basically uh, productivity by you know, being able to look at cost savings, fast completion of projects, and and to realise this in the competitiveness in the global market. Uh, Pat sort of touched on these earlier. These are the, the seven categories of MMC, and um, and you know, going from one to seven, basically showing the 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 three D primary structural systems down to um, number seven, which is the um, uh, the use of the different um, technologies to enhance the, the construction. Um, this is a, a basically, uh, again, Pat touched on this earlier as well, but using different technologies here, like like not just one form of, of um, MMC, but like structural frame, um, precast concrete, bathroom pods, service modules, uh, implementations of digital platforms, and uh, this uh, jump sequence where they actually can construct things um, uh, and sort of work sort of on one level and then you're preparing and setting things up for the next level and and you work up to the buildings and this really improves and and increases the the, the productivity um in the systems so that therefore gives you reduced construction times improved quality control cost savings uh, increased design flexibility safety and increased sustainability and using the use of technology uh, that also then leads itself to an um higher quality buildings. So you, you end up with basically greater precision, increased durability, uh, greater energy efficiency and and um, and design flexibilities in, in that uh, in this. Um, so again, this is another example just showing how this can actually improve the benefits. So we reduce on site labor by a lot of them. Um, there's fewer accidents and injuries on the construction site, improve the working conditions for the people um, there's a lot of work that's done in the factories, uh, increase in safety so that you have um, safety in use where you have more durable and a longer lifespan for the prefabricated 
elements that are uh, that are assembled on site, uh, improving air quality for buildings, buildings with better indoor air quality by using prefabricated components that are made from sustainable materials, greater design flexibility to allow for um, better geometric shapes and forms to be created and, that, and innovative building designs that take into account the well-beings of the occupants. And um, then basically by using MMC techniques, which, um, which enhance the sort of design fabrication assembly at greater precision and accuracy in the final product. And therefore um, you have a smarter and better built buildings. Uh, the three pillars of sustainable development are a economical, environmental and social sustainability. Social sustainability then promotes social injustice, social justice and well-being, improves working conditions for factory workers, reduces on-site labour, creates buildings that promote health and well-being, an example using prefabrication and modular construction. Environmental sustainability maintains an ecological balance, preserves natural resources for future generation, reduces waste, uses sustainable materials, incorporates energy efficient features, and um, economic sustainability that meets the needs of the present without compromising future generations, reducing construction costs, increasing increases productivity and innovation, and supports local economy through the use of local materials. So um, why has why has um, the uh, the adoption of MC at scale in the housing sector failed? So there's there's a number of reasons I suppose in relation to this in terms of lack of awareness and uh, and understanding among the um, apologies uh, among the the different stakeholders in the, in the housing sector developers builders and the consumers limited availability of the skilled labour high initial cost of MNC the cost of equipment and machinery compared to um, traditional construction methods limited supply chain uh, products and materials can, can be difficult to get the materials needed for these projects and then some regulatory and planning barriers. So what we need to do is we need to look at increasing awareness and education among the different stakeholders, show them the benefits and the potentials of the MMC, developing a skilled labor force uh, to be able to work on the projects and try to look at reducing the initial costs of MMC and the, and the cost of equipment and machinery needed to develop, and then to develop a, a robust supply chain um, for the MMC products and components, and then look at addressing the regulatory um, barriers that are currently in place that make it difficult to implement MMC techniques uh, for codes and regulations. This is uh, indicating basically a comparison between the um, the RAI work stages, which is basically the stages from inception of zero for a project up to eight when the project's finished on site and it's it's, it's handed over. And it shows there that the benefits of MMC really uh, matter uh, at the um, initial uh, inception stage. That's when you see the greatest benefits. And as, as you can see, as the project um, uh, develops from inception down to the end, the, the, the benefits are lessened. So the, the advantage is really is, is to try and implement it, uh, MMC at, at the earliest possible stage to look at basically um, um, in, you know, enhancing and de delivering uh, the savings on the actual development. Uh, and um, so this is looking at basically how um, uh, the, how DFMA, Design for Manufacturing Assembly, can uh, enhance um, the uh, use of the, in, in a construction process. So the, the first part of the slide there, which is pre-project shown that the, is, 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 is critical that we look at the strategic definition of the, um, the project to, to, to implement the use of MMC technology in, uh, at the earliest possible stage. Uh, that's when you see the best benefits. And then you look at basically building a business case for the, to, to include for the, um, the aspirations for the strategy for the digital, the digital delivery. And if necessary, appoint an MMC um, sort of specialist to actually uh, to work with the stakeholders on that, and then looking at this basically at the various stages, the, the best way of of um, of enhancing this um, productivity and and uh, and and getting realised uh, solutions here is to actually look at it from um, the, the early stage design uh, cost deliverables, MMC options, and basically. Um, 
uh, doing different options at the earliest stage all the way through uh, to tender and procurement and, and uh, then adopting it. Um, the key benefits for the design is basically increased efficiency in the design process, uh, improved constructability, reduced waste, uh, enhanced collaboration, improved quality control, and uh, the better integration of, of um, building information modeling uh, that can also help uh, uh, to make this enhance the system. Uh, greater flexibility and adaptability to allow for the manufacturing modular and prefabricated components are easier to adapt to change in project requirements and then enhance sustainability for the promoting use of, of uh, sustainable materials and methods, resulting in lower carbon emissions and greater resource efficiency. Um, different stages, again, this is just showing that you have different, uh, in a typical, say, apartment situation, you have different um, systems like, so for instance, things like bathroom pods, kitchen pods, wardrobes, and they can be used and during the design stage that these are all implemented into it. So the actual um, the benefits can be seen uh, by having mass production of, of uh, modularization uh, will, will um, uh, make add speed and, and quality and uh, all the issues that we went through earlier there. Um, this one here is just looking at the, uh, the potential of basically introducing um, uh, materials like so in this case, this is a, a product called Carbon Cure, which is a, a particular concrete that's used um, is it, it's used to basically to reduce the embodied carbon for ready mixed concrete. So you have the, the two story high pre, um, prefabricated precast columns and in the introduction, which in itself um, adds to the speed and, and the, the form of delivery. But the actual product itself, which is the um, the largest carbon uh, elements, are the cement, which is fifty eight percent. By using by pumping CO two into the into the process of the construction of the concrete, it this reduces the actual um, embodied carbon, and thereby you you get seen two the, the the double benefit of actually the speed of erection and the quality and the 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 enhanced sustainability of the actual um, uh, the, the end result. Uh, and that's it then. So just, just to, to say that the use of modern methods of construction is crucial for the construction industry to meet the challenges of sustainability, resilience, and affordability. Uh, thank you. That's Des O'Donnell. Thank you, Des. That's great. And yeah, I think we can all see the benefits of modern methods of construction in terms of health and safety and speed and all these things you've highlighted. Um, I think one part of the, the presentation early on that strikes me, it's always interesting in the car manufacturing world, how you showed the image of lots of robots creating the cars, but yet that never seems to be the case. Or well, certainly with the factories that I have been to, it's always people who are still doing the work within the factories. Um, and we've also we've seen quite a bit of concrete and steel. I, I feel out of my depth in terms of virtually all the construction that I see with housing is very much done on site. But yeah, I am talking probably small scale and and self build, whereas you've covered a lot of much bigger buildings. Um, but it would be interesting to to know if there's any reason the light gauge steel, for example, is um, being being pushed in a big way. Whether there's a, a structural element to this. Um, what do you think, Hugh? Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, I've got a few thoughts, I guess, and maybe like you from Pat's slide, the one that jumps out is the, I suppose, the, the MACE project references where we've got, you know, 70% reduction in construction waste and 50% reduction in embodied carbon. And while that's incredibly compelling, um, I'm then kind of worried about where is the driver for it and, you um, the reference for, I suppose, the importance of mandated um, embodied carbon regulations that control that. And um, I think kind of ultimately that could be the big driver for a lot of what we're talking about. And it's really something that's missing, um, broadly speaking, kind of overall, you know, that while we can build these factories and there's, you know, incredible work that can be done for scale, it may need that um, regulatory approach to to actually kind of force people to make those moves. And I was looking at a couple of questions, I guess, and um, 
you've got this kind of huge buzz right now around MMC and modern methods of construction and lots of different companies are investing lots of money in factories all over the world. Um, and I suspect there's people on the, you know, in the chat here that have some strong opinions on that. Some of those factories have failed and for different reasons in different places. But um, yeah, kind of I'm wondering, and maybe Brian, you could be a good person to jump in here, but are the factors, you know, kind of without this mandated carbon um, reduction, you know, as part of the regulations brought in, are the factors of safety, speed, CO2 reduction, productivity, or bridging the labor gap, are they enough um, to maintain the investment that's going into the offsite industry overall? Um, you know, is the pipeline strong enough or do, do you see the pipeline growing actually to, you know, to sustain that? Yeah, um, look, at it's, it's, it's probably the most interesting topic because there has been some pretty major failures in, in large factories, particularly in the UK over the last probably 12 months, you know, and when you really analyse what was the reason, and you mentioned some of them there, but I think a big one is the lack of standardisation. So when you think about all the great buildings we build, they're actually all kind of a bespoke kind of prototype when you think about it, you know, at the first of, of one and then you go on to a different design. So that really doesn't work in mass production. And we, while we want to keep our architecture um, unique, we, we have to focus on kind of the functional buildings and the core of the buildings as really standard. Um, and once we standardize that design, our factories are set up. If you go the opposite way and try and set up a factory for, you know, um, various different designs and all that, you need to build in huge agility. And that doesn't work in mass production. Your cost base will always be high. So I think one of the keys is trying to standardize your base design, have the add on customization that can create magnificent looking buildings. But what's behind that, the structure, the skeleton, all of that fire detail and all of that is kind of a very much standardized approach that's agreed across the board. And I think that's going to be a game changer. And I can see that happening, Hugh, in, in some of the, particularly around government bodies, they're starting to realize that, you know, we can't have various different designs in, in different places, you know? Yeah, it's a, it's a good answer, Brian, and pretty much was my next question as well. <laughs> I was kind of getting into, actually. Um, I've spoken to people setting up factories and they're kind of of that opinion that um, it just doesn't fit to create the factory to build, you know, what people are getting permits for or planning regulations for, that it, it, it just doesn't match, you know, the things need to be really designed from back then. And I guess that's kind of the next question I was going to ask, and it, it could be a view or Pat, maybe even from the UK side of things, kind of what's happening in that space, you know, to support the FMA, is there, you know, do we see changes in, I know part B or for fire is due to change in Ireland soon. And, you know, that has potential to, you know, bring in some improvements for MMC, but, you know, from a planning point of view, that seems to be huge um, and really maybe the biggest problem, you know, for how we can build sustainably using offsite construction. Sure, if I, if I could come in there, uh, you, um, <clears throat> I think if we look at, uh, I suppose, uh, multiple, points made there uh, by Brian also. Um, I think in my view, it's the, it, one of the biggest uh, barriers actually to uh, the adoption of higher rates of, of MMC. And I, I see in the chat um, the question in relation to what else we see high levels of MMC is not really impacting on, uh, on the overall cost of projects at the moment. But I think if we look at the maturity levels of using uh, the various categories of MMC, in projects certainly is not at that level where it is beginning to really influence in terms of productivity and cost and as we get into more pre-manufactured value on sites i think that will change i think in terms of um certainly uh factories um and the driver for um mass standardization the, the construction industry is significantly defragmented you know we're procuring particularly here in ireland at, at governmental level we're procuring projects on a project by project basis. So to get that impetus to, to develop up and invest at factory level to start producing uh, um, you know, volumetric modular, I think it's incredibly difficult. And I'm sure Brian would have uh, certain thoughts on that. So I think at governmental level, we need to look at um, a centralized approach, 
but that actually has its challenges also in, in the UK, as Brian alluded to, in terms of some major um, uh, manufacturers uh, shutting down last year and, and, and ceasing production. Even though the UK government have policies where they're linking low carbon uh, construction policies to MMC policy, uh, policies with significant investment um, in framework. So I think that there's, there's something happening that we really need to, to review uh, and zone in. And, and one final point in terms of DFMA, um, uh, at the end of last year, uh, I co-authored the, uh, the Royal Institute of Architects uh, DFMA overlay approach to design that, that Des uh, alluded to. So it's, it's, change, it's getting that mindset to integrating early adoption uh, of construction process, understanding the impacts of construction standardization. You know, if we if we um, relate um, a, a built asset to perhaps uh, the automotive industry, you know, there's a lot of standardized components in uh, in the automotive industry that can swap and change. You know, they're, they're not unique. Um, certain aspects of, of, of cars are unique and, and different brands. But, you know, when you get under that bonnet, there, there's multiple uh, elements that are standardized. So going back to, to Brian's point, you know, we need to move to uh, standardization, perhaps move to a platform based approach uh, in terms of that, that centralized procurement where we have standardized platforms of uh, kits of parts where we can start pulling from. And then that begins to um, to begins to, to, to create the economies of scale to, to really address the, the issues within the industry. Yeah, I think that uh, standardization point is a really important one, isn't it? And I know we've had questions in as well, uh, retrofit. So I think that we ought to check in with Zach. Great. Yeah, thank you, everybody. And um, we do have a number of questions. And we know that um, the presenters have graciously agreed to stay another 15 minutes. So I, I recognize, though, that it's the top of the hour. So if if you need to move, if, for folks in the audience, if you need to move on to the next part of your life today, we totally understand. Um, that said, I think we'll roll into this bonus 15 minutes here with some questions. Um, the first, and I and I, I just uh, shared the queue for questions in the chat, but the first question comes from, and, I, and I'm sorry, I should know this by now, but is it, is it Gaul or Gale Spanier? It's Gaul, you got it, right, the first time. All right, Thanks. great. Thanks, Gaul. It's good and, to see you. Uh, uh, thanks a lot to the presenters, and <clears throat> I'll maybe reframe my questions a little bit since uh, a lot has been talked. But basically, what I see in the U.S. is that um, uh, between uh, volumetric and panelized, it's um, almost a, a cap thing. You either define yourself as one or the other. And when uh, Brian was speaking, I'm trying to think if it's possible to look at like panelized as something that either feeds the volumetric or goes out to um, to the site to feed like an on-site panelized building or even an existing building, um, or are like sort of like the nature of volumetric too different. And uh, so happy to hear any of the presenters opinion on that. Um, yeah, I can take that if, if so it's been. Um, so Gal, yeah, no, great question. And I suppose us being um, a manufacturer um, originally of, of panelized, um, it was kind of natural flow that we, we fed then, as you said, the 3D factory off that 2D panelized line. And um, the, the only difference really is in your buildups and that. So you can absolutely use your panelized line to feed the external world, if you like, um, but uh, your buildups and your efficiency might, might reduce. So while it can be done, it's not ideal. And um, we've probably uh, developed into nearly fully cat one um, business and um, our panelized actually external isn't our main product at all. It just feeds our 3D assembly, but it, it can still feed externally. And look at some developments still suit a cat too absolutely and um, you know and and um, and we can still do that but it's not the most efficient sometimes you're better going with one you know great thank you gal all right next up is philip jordan well i i hello thank you very much i i was simply concerned and remain concerned about the lack of retrofit uh focus uh in certainly in the uk and i don't know what it's like in america or or other countries but we just don't have um, much of a retrofit uh, initiative going on. And it needs, we've only got, according to the 
IPCC last April, we've only got basically another two years to reduce, to begin to reduce emissions, to begin to reduce emissions. They're currently still going up and they mustn't and they can't, but we won't get to the 1.5 lifestyle if we, if, we, if we carry on at the rate we're going. And you won't, we certainly won't do it if we just do it, if we just focus on new build being efficient. Because in the UK, we only have around about a third of a million new homes a year, if we're lucky. Um, and, and we, it, that's just historic. Uh, whereas we've got 29 million existing homes, according to the Climate Change Committee, and around 2 million non-domestic buildings existing. And almost all are way out of line with the standards that we need to ha have in retrofit. That's, that's my statement of fact. Uh, you know, it's, um, it's great to see modern methods of construction, but I, it doesn't, it's not really relevant, is it? To, um, I, I know energy sprung, et cetera, exists, but, but where's the link to what we should be doing? Uh, if I could come in there, it's, it's Pat. I think it actually, I, I perhaps I could sit, talk in the context of, um, Irish, uh, the Irish government's approach to to energy retrofitting. I think we have we're certainly addressing it uh, as uh, at um, at at high level. We're promoting um, major funding uh, for uh, householders to to engage uh, in deep energy retrofitting. I think I, um, I think the issue is that we're not doing we're not carrying out deep energy retrofitting at scale. So at the moment here in Ireland in particular, it's individual. So it's up to the individual house owner to engage with uh, um, a contractor to perhaps you know, upgrade their home. So we need to be doing it at mass. We need to be doing it at scale. We need to articulate better the benefits of deep energy for retrofitting. You know, if you're saying, okay, energy costs are significantly rising, uh, we're putting forward the business case, you know, it's going to cost X, Y, and Z in terms of uh, to, to get that. Where are the benefits? What, what, what's the payback? What does it actually mean to the house owner to do that? And I think that's something that we, as um, as a nation or as, as a, um, a, a certain policy uh, adoption, we need to start articulating better. Certainly the, the, from an MMC point of view, I think Brian shared some uh, fantastic examples, you know, of how we might go about doing that. And, and I think there, if we start looking at modern methods of construction as a means to address uh, deep energy retrofitting, it's not going to be addressed until we get the, the economies of scale. So if we can start getting mass adoption, mass energy retrofitting at you know, um, development scale, I think then we begin to really see the benefits of particularly uh, modern methods of construction as a means to achieve it achieve the deep energy retrofitting if that makes sense yes it makes sense the riba has issued a statement along with is it called the uk building council and they're both saying we should we should approach this in a wartime basis which is rather an echo of what somebody in canada did a year or so ago i saw something which said we should be we should be doing what was done in the second world war and they and they showed what what canada canada had done in the second world war and there's a video link uh, to both that i've got and that I've, I've circulated quite a lot but nobody's really following it up i'm afraid because unless you do approach things in that sort of scale you're not going to achieve um what people known is necessary i just draw it to people's attention <laughs> i think just just from a manufacturer point of view phil you're dead right like even in ireland like the numbers are you know we're only in in the low percentage of what should be retrofitted like a couple of percent it's, it's crazy yeah. when you look at the numbers and it's the exact same in ireland so we i just sent a link on the drive zero r d project that's just complete in the midlands in ireland where we actually panelized and um, the retrofit around a, a semi D and um, really interesting. Then we done a cap one product as a porch on the front. So, so there is, you know, it, it can be done and it has to be done at scale. As Pat said, you know, it cannot be done in fragmented process. Um, but, uh, well, there's energy sprung and there's BT, BT passive or something yeah. that, but it, it is, that's, there's several different systems around, but you need to, as you say, you need to apply them at scale. 
anyway, that's that's uh, perhaps blowing the, the the main thing of today's talk off course. No, no, it's it's absolutely central to to the project, Philip. Thank you very much for your comments and your question. Um, okay, so up next is Jeff Colley. Jeff, thank you for joining us today. I'm, I'm Hi, Zachary. To I'm, I'll keep my video off because I've got dodgy internet here. Yep. Um, yep. And ho hopefully it'll it'll hold up for this. No, uh, thank you. Some very interesting presentations. Um, I uh, just put forward a question about. Um, I suppose I have concerns about um, the usefulness of the term MMC um, because um, it's a catch-all term um, that doesn't really necessarily say very much about what is and isn't, you know, what the boundaries are, about what kinds of systems you include and exclude. We um, published in the magazine, in Passivist Plus magazine, a couple of issues ago, um, an, an analysis. Uh, the headline referenced the, the, the mockumentary uh, Spinal Tap. Um, it's called Up to 11 was the name of the uh, the article because you run out of headlines after a while when you're publishing a magazine you know um and um it was a uh, we had 11 different build systems um included and it was a reference to the guitar player who wanted an amplifier that went up to 11 rather than 10 so it'd go louder um but anyway the point was that we looked at different build systems compared uh to including a number of mmc systems uh and compared them to um uh to traditional construction and uh, it was very clear when we did um, embodied carbon calculations for, for the different build systems that some MMCs were way better than traditional construction um, and some were in fact worse. Um, so uh, I just find, you know, I, mean, I think there's a lot, there are some, I suppose, benefits to MMC that, that are kind of nearly universal to MMC. Um, but the idea of ascribing particular sustainability benefits in particular to, to MMC generically, I, um, I struggle with, frankly, you know, I wonder if anyone has any comments on that, on, on you know, on its usefulness as a term. Uh, hi, Jeff. Pass, uh, pass here, um, Caravan. Um, uh, I think if you, it, I think if you begin to look at individual LMs, MMC categories, and you compare one category to another, and you're comparing, you know, are you comparing apples to apples, uh, et cetera? So the, the key is actually, it's looking at it at a more holistic level in terms of the, the overall built asset. What I, I think Des had a fantastic uh, slide where you begin to um, look at the materials used to uh, incorporate it in the, the, the certain category of MMC where you're looking at concrete, say, for example, and you say, okay, you know, what is the embodied energy uh, calculation of concrete? How do I reduce that? And then also then integrating that within the, the, the form of, uh, say, precast, for example. So now you're beginning to not fully address embodied carbon, but you're beginning to look at how might I go about reducing embodied carbon within this certain form of uh, MMC. And then if you take that on a, a larger scale within the overall built asset, you can then look at, um, you know, what does it mean? And this is where, particularly in terms of uh, a DFMA approach, um, and uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the, the RII DFMA overlay that, that we um, <clears throat> launched uh, later la late last year, where we begin to look at MMC optioneering at an early stage. And a key part of that is looking at the environmental issues looking at the embodied carbon, looking at any other uh, elements such as air tightness or whatever it may be in terms of the overall energy performance of the building and coming up with a strategy uh, to address those and not just alluding and not just zoning in on one particular aspect or one particular category of MMC, but looking at them at a more holistic level. And of course, you're going to get different, um, you know, even if you look at a uh, full volumetric modular um, where you get a, a steel frame or whatever it may be, the embodied carbon and the issues of uh, uh, one volumetric modular unit from one country will be different to a different country because you need to look at obviously the energy mix that's being used to uh, to to manufacture uh, the, the the components uh, etc. So I think that there's a lot there, but I think in summary, in my view, the key is to look at it at a more holistic level, not just zone in on any one particular MMC category but see how all of those categories may together um, combine when combined to uh, to address the environmental uh, aspects of, of the built asset thanks for, thanks very much yeah it, it uh, it's very it's very interesting um 
uh, it, it's, a, it's a struggle. I, I have to say the, the point that Hugh made before about, you know, just setting embodied carbon targets. If you're looking at that one subject, for instance, regulating it, that for me, I think is the solution. And let, uh, you know, and, and I'm sure that that MMC systems that and the thinking that comes with it, it's possible to achieve greater improvements, perhaps, you know, uh, with, with many M MMC systems than it will be with 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 a lot of traditional construction. Um, but I just I just fear people's myself included its tendency to kind of oversimplify things and look for you know it's very I can just see uh, people procuring and saying oh sure we'll put in an MMC uh, you know we'll, we'll go to tender from an MMC and that'll be our our sustainability covered you know rather than actually setting enough uh, specific uh, robust stringent sustainability requirements uh, to keep them honest you know. I would agree, and actually, it it really shows the importance of um, building the awareness and the knowledge aspect in terms of educating. Uh, you know, it, you're doing a fantastic job in in Pacifiers Plus, and um, you know, it, it's it's you know, articles and publications and building the case studies so that we can build up that knowledge as an industry, and it's certainly not just taking. OK, I'm using an MMC uh, category or a building, and this is my tick box to a, a better sustainable uh, asset. So I think it's there's multi layers, I think, in, in this. But I guess we have to start someplace. We need to start moving from a sustainability point of view. Um, but we also need to, to, to build that knowledge and, and uh, um, skills uh, to, to achieve it. I agree, Pat and Jeff. Just on it from again from a manufacturing point of view, you know the build up. So actually, even just measuring our buildings, that's the first step. And I think we're doing a lot of there's a lot of talk in the industry, but we actually have to start measuring. So just one of the things we're creating a tool that will just measure all the various different build ups, and then as Pat said, you can optioneer as you develop. You know, even from the groundworks, what type of foundations you use, and you have various different options of various different body carbon. So. So um, I think the measurement is the first step and um, knowing the various different options and then uh, setting them targets is, is going to what has to drive it. Thank you. Uh, excellent and provocative uh, comments and, and slash question there and I have really insightful uh, answers. So uh, we have one more question. If, if, if you have a question brewing in your mind, please, uh, please pose it in chat. Um, otherwise we'll start to, to wrap things up, but our, our, Final question at this point comes comes from Diarmid Cronin, and my apologies for probably butchering your first name. I, I'll I'll go ahead and ask the question on, on your behalf. So, um, is BIM for all design teams teams members using MMC an absolute must? So, is BIM an absolute must? Any comment on the embodied carbon of the steel frame slash extruded aluminum? Uh, element versus the alternative. Uh, there, so there, there are a number of questions here. How vertical and horizontal, um, how are vertical and horizontal fire cavity barriers dealt with? And um, uh, maybe we, we keep it to that. So is BIM an absolute month, must? Um, comments on and body carbon uh, around steel frame and extruded aluminum element and um, vertical and horizontal cavity barriers. Um, yeah, if I, if I can start. So, so from our side, I feel BIM is a must, you know, it can be done from, you know, a, from a kind of a 2D environment, but it's highly inefficient and highly inaccurate. So, so yes, to, to drive MMC, BIM is a must um, from our side. And um, I, I might just shoot down the, the carbon one because we deal a lot in steel. And I think, you know, um, while steel might have a higher carbon in the, the raw manufacturing, it has quite a high recycle content. So the circularity of steel is, is where we need to be starting to really think about it. And we're creating assets that can be used in the future. And this is where Pat mentioned about component-based platform-led designs that you actually own assets that can be reused. And I see a lot of companies actually starting to recycle steel members and that. So that's that's real positive for the for the steel steel industry. Um, and the final piece then vertical horizontal fire cavity barriers. That's that is that is absolutely key, particularly to modular um, construction and um, control of voids, understanding where voids are. So this is done first of all, your, your fire tests, your, your baseline. Um, having the correct fire test and then 
control and so priority boarding the way you wrap the main structure and um, so we always talk about dealing with the main structure first um, and that and then looking at how you deal with the vertical and horizontal barriers so if there is any voids and um, they, they need to be dealt with and um, with traditional type materials but placed in the factory and um, and uh, the final comment on site testing so off-site testing certification for fire so i think you know, it's a big challenge in the industry at the minute. Every business, including ourselves, is, is spending a huge amount of money in testing um, and there's not enough knowledge sharing. So I think what has to happen in the industry and I know MMC Ireland and Pat, what Pat is leading on their side is trying to get more collaboration, more sharing of information. Um, and I think that's going to really help help the industry um, because at the minute there's very disjointed and everyone's doing their own tests holding that IP, but I think sharing that will actually benefit the industry as a whole. Um, and particularly, you know, the lack of fire uh, test houses is a challenge as well, and timing for fire tests can be quite a long lead time. Sorry, just, just to come in on one, it's Pat here, just to come in on one um, one point that, that Brian made in regards to fire testing, and, um, you know, particularly we need to look at it at a, an overall build-up approach and not just individual um individual mmc components or elements particularly if you look at um volumetric modular you have a volumetric modular unit perhaps with an external facade skin so what is the Im impact of the external facade skin perhaps on the on the volumetric modular unit so it is a complex uh, area where we need to begin to look at whole system build-ups in terms of performance testing and not just rely on individual uh, individual components Fantastic. Thanks, Pat. I, I, we have one last question. I think I think we can probably squeeze this one in and then we will need to, to wrap up. So Patrick, too, um, can you ask away? Hi, hi Zach. Um, hey, Patrick. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering about, um, you know, livability uh, considerations when you look at um, Brian's reply to you on standardized core design. I mean, um, a happy building, happy occupant is a happy building and a happy building is a happy occupant in reverse. So um, is there any uh, consideration in the uh, MMC process for, uh, you know, recreation and livability and those type of concerns? Because we see invariably uh, looking at, um, you know, social housing and the monotony of some social housing um, in the past, that how it has created such trouble for you know harmonious living in a in a new build. So I just wonder is that catered for by the MMC uh, process at all, or is it a design element? I, I take it. Sorry, I just, <laughs> it's Pat here. I, I take that also. I guess coming from a designer's point of view, and, and I see where you're leading to in terms of having identical buildings. You know, yeah. if, if we start producing mass producing buildings, are we going to get? Building after building after building the same, and you know uh, what what is the quality of life uh, for the building occupants? And I think that's what it's alluding to there in terms of a pl platform approach. Whereas if we can look at uh, standardization, but with mass customization, now you may seem that's a contradict. But if we look at you know what are the standardized components that we can build within an overall built asset. And then take those standardized components and use them, perhaps you know, in a in a way where we're beginning to um, articulate the architecture of the different uh, built environments, and then we can really then see, you know, the last thing we want to do in terms of identical buildings um, and uh, really push on the, uh, on the design in terms of the quality of life. Quality of life is not just obviously the design of the built asset, but it's also you know the um, the, the indoor air quality, you know, what, what does it mean in terms of the, the materials that we're using within the, the, the various MMC components? So that's something that we, you know, we can look at through the um, uh, the development of, of MMC. But certainly, as I, to summary, the, the, the answer to the question, I think if we look at it on a standard, a, a component level, and then we say, okay, how can we standardize the main components to really then begin to deliver that customization uh, so that we can really deliver a high quality built environment from a, from a design point of view. Oh, thanks, Pat. Uh, pretty comprehensive reply there. And covers, covers a couple of my concerns. Thanks very much. 
And I think just from a manufacturing point of view, again, I think I agree with Pat, you know, the, there's, there's the main parts of the build, the main structure, the main details that we, we look at, uh, platform-led approach, standardizing them, and then having customizable, whether it's facades, and just building in flexibility even, you know, in some of the layouts. So while we use kind of hot roll steel frame, it creates flexibility in the future that internal walls can be moved or if there's adaptability. So you can actually build in that flexibility in the future as well. So it's about thinking about it up front, I think is, is the key. All right. Well, I think that that uh, does it. So I'll throw it to Ben and Hugh for some closing comments. Yeah, I don't think I have much more to add. Very interesting. Clearly lots of scope for expansion. Um, I guess my point is really just keep measuring, making sure the embodied carbon and also the operational energy really is like that on, on site. And yeah, I think there's plenty of scope here, isn't there? Uh, what do you think, Hugh? Yeah, I guess, um, look, at, as always, a big thanks to Brian, Pat and Des for the open sharing of info and allowing everyone to ask them lots of questions. Um, same to Michelle, Uli and Dara for all the work in the background um, and to Zach and Kim. But I think we always get back to embodied carbon in these chats. So, yeah, it's, we may have to change the name. Um, but, um, you know, it's really interesting. It's, it's a key topic and we're going to hear a lot more about it this year. I think it was kind of, in a way, progress in that direction was derailed um, with COVID and you can see it really coming back to the forefront of everyone's mind again so it's important and good that we can have that discussion. Great thank you Hugh, thank you Ben, thanks everybody for being here and uh, great pr presentations. Uh, we will be back again next month so please stay tuned and enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Mm -hmm.